Uh, the reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 8, and we're reading 27 through to 38 verses. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea and Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. Do you not have in mind the concerns of God? You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For, for, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Here ends the lesson. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's always a privilege to come here and preach from God's word. I'd just like to add my word of welcome along with Mike's welcome to our 10 o'clock service. My name is Andrew. For those who don't know me, I'm one of the ministers here at All Saints. It's great to be here with you this morning. So we are in week six of our Mark sermon series, and um, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 8, the end of Mark chapter 8, where we'll learn some very, um, very profound lessons that Jesus will be teaching his disciples, and we'll come to a turning point of the gospel of Mark. So in a former life, I used to teach private guitar lessons, you know, as one of my main sources of income. I had lots of students of all ages and different skill levels, and I really enjoyed teaching. You know, I found teaching quite rewarding, especially when I saw students, you know, really starting to improve in their musicianship. I did, however, have some students that were a little bit harder to teach than others. You know, those lessons might not have been quite as enjoyable. You know, lessons where I just felt like I was teaching the same thing just over and over and over again because they just couldn't seem to get their heads or their hands around a certain musical concept or technique. I try to teach in different ways in hopes that maybe they'll get it and then be able to move on, but it can be pretty frustrating. But when a student gets that light bulb moment and I see them finally starting to get it, it's amazing. When it all starts to make sense to them and they start to thrive, you see, our Christian life can be a little bit like that sometimes. And we'll see it with the disciples as they journeyed with Jesus, seeing Jesus perform miracle after miracle, teaching them parable after parable. These things all pointed to who Jesus is, but obviously just went way over their heads. Just after they witnessed feeding Jesus, feeding the thousands for the second time, I might add, they were still worried about how little bread they brought with them for the next trip. And Jesus expresses his frustration at them. He said to them, do you still not understand? The disciples just didn't get it. 
But as you heard from today's Bible passage, they're about to. They're about to have that light bulb moment where things will gradually start to make sense. And this is where the gospel of Mark hits a turning point for us as well, where we start to see who Jesus really is and what it really means for him to be the Messiah, where the proclamation of who Jesus is changes everything for the disciples. It changes the direction of Mark's gospel, and Jesus starts to show us exactly who he is and what he came to earth to do. And it's at this point in the gospel that I'd like us to ponder three questions. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you know what Jesus came to do? And do you know what it means to follow him? Why don't we pray and ask for God's help? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can gather here as your church to worship you, to hear your word, and to have fellowship as the people of God. Lord, we ask for your help. We ask that as we hear your word proclaimed, that you would open our eyes to really see who Jesus is, that you would open our ears to really hear his words, and that you would open our hearts to be transformed by his Holy Spirit. Help us to truly understand who Jesus is, what he came to do, and what it means for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you could keep your Bibles open at Mark chapter 8, that'd be great. Now, I'd just like to frame my passage a little better, okay, with a quick run-through of what happens earlier in the chapter. So after the feeding of the 4,000, which Mike preached about last week, Jesus now has a brief confrontation with the Pharisees, who demanded that Jesus show them a sign from heaven, you know, right after he just fed thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and, a, and some dried fish. And it says Jesus, after they asked him this question, he, he sighed deeply, as if to say, Really? And he rebuked them for their continued desire for signs and outward works of God. Then Jesus says something quite profound to the disciples. He says, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. So this yeast he was talking about was, was of course, not to be taken literally, but it was to represent the error of the Pharisees and King Herod. Their reliance and emphasis on outward human works while neglecting the inward work of God in their hearts, caring more about human concerns rather than God's. And Jesus calls it yeast because like a little yeast can permeate and affect the ingredients to make bread, their false teaching had the ability to permeate and affect the lives of people around them. Now let's park this thought right here for a second because it will make sense a bit later as we go through today's passage. So why don't we get into it? Please read with me. Mark 8 from verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So Jesus is basically asking the disciples here, what are people saying about me? Who do they say I am? And from what the disciples responded to Jesus, we can see people thought very highly of Jesus. Because they were thinking maybe John the Baptist or Elijah, one of their legendary prophets, has come back, you know. They were, of course, very wrong. But Jesus wasn't too interested in what the other people thought. He asked this question to lead into the next one. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And these questions Jesus asked are great questions, not only for the original disciples, but for us. If you were to ask people around you today... Who do you say Jesus is? You get uh, various responses, okay? Some might say confidently, he's the son of God. Some might say he was a religious leader. Some might say he was a great teacher, you know, a kind man who taught about love and good stuff. Some might not be so positive and say things like, oh, he was a fraud or he was a cult leader. And different people will have different opinions of Jesus depending on their knowledge of him and their life experience. But at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, what other people say doesn't matter. What matters is who you say Jesus is, which is why Jesus turns the question around for his disciples and says, okay, that's what these guys say. Who do you say I am? And by the grace of God, the apostle Peter says, you are the Messiah. And for us reading the Bible, we say, finally, finally. <laughs> Finally, these guys aren't missing the point. 
after the countless miracles Jesus performed and the parables he told, many of which fulfilled Jewish prophecies about the Messiah, Peter and the disciples are finally getting it. And I don't know if you've thought about it this way, but the proclamation from Peter is another miracle from God. Because it takes a supernatural work of God in someone's heart for them to proclaim this truth, let alone to proclaim it to Jesus in his face. (laughs) But as we see later, Peter doesn't quite get it yet. And Jesus, knowing this, warns the disciples not to tell anybody about him. Now, before we move on, I would like you to pause and just ask yourself, who do you say Jesus is? Is he the Messiah? Is he the one that came to die on the cross for the sins of the world? Or is he just a nice guy who you can learn some good moral lessons from? Is he someone you were told to believe in, but you never understood why? Is he someone you pray to in tough times in hopes that he might make you happier, healthier, or wealthier? Who do you say Jesus is? And after Peter's proclamation, we'll see the narrative of the gospel completely changing. The focus now shifts to what the Messiah has to do to complete his mission. And it's not what everyone expected. Verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. What a strange and confusing thing to say. It would be like a newly elected prime minister comes up to the inauguration speech and says, during my time as prime minister, everyone is going to reject me and eventually have me killed. Doesn't make sense, does it? at least not in a worldly or human perspective. You see, the long-awaited Jewish Messiah was expected to be this powerful ruler who would overthrow the Romans and build his own earthly kingdom. And Peter, the one who just boldly proclaimed Jesus as Messiah, continues in his boldness, but also exposes a bit of his foolishness now. Verse 32, he, Jesus, spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. That's a harsh rebuke. One minute you think you've spoken a powerful truth about God, then the next minute you're rebuked as an agent of the devil himself. Jesus, of course, didn't mean that Peter was Satan, but he rebuked Satan as the source of this behavior. Jesus rebuked the one who is 100% against the mission of the Messiah to die for the sins of the world. And here we see that the yeast of the Pharisees that we talked about before it had infected Peter. You know, and Jesus points this out, that Peter's problem was the same as the Pharisees. He was caring more about human concerns than God's concerns. In Peter's case, maybe it was the whole traveling around, you know, healing people, casting out demons, drawing these huge crowds in, this huge, beautiful display of the power of God. How could Jesus continue this amazing ministry if he's dead? Ever try to imagine what Peter said to Jesus? Jesus, could you come here for a second? You need to relax. You're not going to die. Stop saying you're going to die. Look at how good things are right now. You know, the people love you. The crowds are growing. Please stop talking nonsense. And Jesus doesn't have a bar of that. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus' role as Messiah wasn't to do a heap of impressive things and to overthrow worldly power so he could live a comfy life as a powerful earthly king. Jesus, the Messiah, came to sacrifice himself, to die on the cross to pay the penalty for all of our sin. Do you know what Jesus came to do? Look, I know I just kind of explained it to you, but you hear it explained to you every Sunday. But I still have to ask because I can't see what is in your heart. Because there are many professing Christians who've been going to church for decades and decades, yet still don't quite get the gospel. They don't understand it. People who focus on outward acts and doing the Christian things while neglecting what God truly cares about. A transformed heart that desires His will above their own. Peter didn't fully get the work of the Messiah, but how could he? The work wasn't finished yet. And Jesus, seeing this, explains further about what following the Messiah means. Verse 34, 
Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So whether you've studied this passage once or dozens or hundreds of times, do you know what it means to follow Jesus? Because Jesus tells us right here really clearly, if you want to be his disciple, it's going to cost you. Well, how much, you might ask? You know, how much money? How many relationships? What, what is it going to cost? Jesus says, if you're serious, it's going to cost you your life. Look at the job description. Disciples of Jesus will deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Jesus, lose their life for the sake of Jesus and the gospel. Now, I had a long, hard look at this slide when I made it because I had to do some serious self-reflection. Is your life about getting over yourself, putting aside selfish and worldly desires, and pursuing what God desires? Is your life about sacrifice for the sake of Jesus and telling others about Him? Or do you find something within yourself resisting this? If that's you, then Jesus says, what use is it if you gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? He says, if you're ashamed of me and my words now, then when I return to judge the world with my army of angels, I'm going to be ashamed of you. You see, the call to follow Jesus is not an easy one. And it takes a miracle of God in your heart to realize who Jesus is, know what he came to do, and understand the cost it takes to follow him. Peter didn't quite get it. He didn't see the work of the Messiah yet. But God did help him start to see who Jesus is. And if we fast forward in the story, spoiler alert, we know that Peter messes up again and again. He does. But when the work of Jesus was complete, when Jesus lived a sinless life, when he died on the cross for the sins of the world, when he rose again, defeating sin and death, and when the Holy Spirit was given to all believers, Peter became the bravest and boldest evangelist, one of the bravest, I'd say, that the world will ever know. And he, like many of the original disciples, literally took up their cross to follow Jesus and preach the gospel until they were killed for their faith. Rumor has it that Peter was even crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die in the same way Jesus did. Look, I'm not preaching this sermon to tell you to leave everything you're doing now, head off to join a persecuted church so you can get killed for your faith. Maybe the Lord has a plan for you, I don't know. But not everyone is called into the mission field in those ways. It was very humbling hearing about the corpse. You know, it's wonderful to hear stories about that. People really counting the cost and giving their lives for Jesus. But if you are a follower of Jesus, you also have a mission. Whether you're with your family, your friends, if you're at work or at school, or wherever you are in life. Stop being concerned about the external and temporal things of this world. And start being concerned about the internal and eternal things of God. You see, your life should be primarily about sharing the good news of Jesus with the people around you. And it's hard. It can be really hard. But I'm hoping and praying that after we've sat under the Lord's Word today, that God will work a miracle in our hearts to help each of us see just a little clearer the majesty of Jesus the Messiah, the suffering servant, the beauty of the cross where Jesus willingly died to pay for all of our sins and the eternal reward of denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus. Friends, I pray that today you have had a light bulb moment where you start to get it just a little more, where a life of sacrifice for the cause of Christ makes sense and you start to grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ for life. Amen.